Good evening, mathematicians and lay mathematical enthusiasts, if that's such a term. Good to have you joining me in the second video. If you haven't watched the first, you might want to go find a direct proof of the Riemann hypothesis part one. Okay. If you've already watched that, then you know what this one is going to be about. All right. Again, my name is Jeff Cook, and uh, about a year and a half ago, I approached Greg Bulk and Dennis Allen um, with some uh, discovery I made, and uh, this paper that is in preprint now is the result of a year and a half uh, work of hammering on it, banging away at it, uh, have another mathematician look at it. It is entitled A Direct Proof of the Riemann Hypothesis. Okay, you can find this preprint by going to Google, do a search for ResearchGate, Cook Riemann hypothesis, and it should be the first uh, link that comes up. You should be able to get the PDF from there. Uh, you do not need to be a member of ResearchGate to download it. It is public. If you can't uh, find it on Google, just kind of uh, go to researchgate.net and do a search on my name, Jeffrey Cook, or Dennis Allen. Greg Allen is not there. If you want a little bit more background, um, you can watch the first video, uh, background on us. Uh, or you can check out uh, um, some of uh, my and uh, um, Dennis's research there if it's public. I, I'm not sure if all of this is public, but I do believe his profile is. Okay, good. All right, before we get in, as you know from my other videos, um, I'm a big fan of dark humor, I like Joseph Heller, Catch-22, he's just all, all of this. I, I really like looking at the world this way uh, because, you know, when something is not allowed to be laughed at, it just makes it all the funnier. Okay, so um, you might want to, if you're interested in that as well, um, I am not only, uh, I'm not only into math, I think the world doesn't need any more stuffy mathematicians. We have computers for that. If you want a good laugh, please do check out Woe to the Hunted, second edition. Um, it is uh, available at Amazon and pretty much everywhere else. Okay, um, it does have some good reviews from top reviewers at Amazon. Um, so Grady Harp is a Hall of Fame top 50 reviewer. He writes, Jeff Cook pounces onto the literary scene with a fascinating first novel. That is one of the more interesting concepts in storytelling to grace the bookshelves in some time. It is not only um, my first novel, it is my only novel. So I'm in the uh, into nonfiction. But I do love literary fiction, particularly dark humor. Uh, Daniel Jolly, super nice guy, and a Hall of Fame Vine voice, uh, um, gave five stars. And he writes, Jeff Cook's first novel really stands out from the crowd in terms of both originality and excellent, insightful writing. Thank you. All right. I do have another book. It is nonfiction. It covers, it's called In Light of What We Are. It covers mm, about everything kind of from the ancient a concept of light uh, uh, to today, and uh, um, particularly, and even covers a little bit on Einstein um, and his concept of uh, matter being the condensation of electromagnetic fields. Uh, also, a lot on Faraday, uh, Maxwell, and Euler. Also, who we spoke about in who I spoke about in the last video. Um, a lot about Euler as well, as you know. I love Euler. Well, not in that way. Anyway, cool. I am married, and he's dead. All right, part two, part two, um, the Riemann hypothesis. In the last video, we were talking about uh, prospect, prospecting for gold, uh, particularly uh, in mathematics. Okay, so uh, the sieve of Arath, and, and it's remember from the video, I'm glad this is the last time I have to mention this, Arathosthenes, I don't even know how to say his name, and I, I, I don't care. All right, he didn't know how to say my name either. All right, it's Jeff Cook, though. All right, um, in this part, we're going to get into the Riemann hypothesis itself, okay? And uh, I'm going to cover, there are many videos out there on the zeta function. There are many videos out there on the Riemann hypothesis, but none that I could read, that I could reference to give the background of where we go with the proof. Okay, so like Euler was prospecting for his findings in one area and everyone else is prospecting for the Riemann hypothesis, uh, proof of the Riemann hypothesis in other areas, I went a different direction. And um, so I kind of have to give a little background on the Riemann hypothesis that touches on the areas where we go. All right, and so um, there is a lot of ground to cover. I'm not going to cover the areas that do not 
uh, lead up to the proof. Um, but what is, oh, before we get into the real hypothesis, yeah. Um, so in the last video, also, we kind of got up to the Riemann zeta function, okay, which is the analytic continuation of the generalization of the harmonic series, all right? So the generalization of the harmonic series, if you didn't watch the last video, is this. And this is Euler, the Euler product of it, and uh, where he used something like the sieve of, and I'm not going to say his name, and uh, um, and in, in his paper on the number of uh, primes less than a given magnitude, Riemann came up uh, with what is uh, called, often called, the functional equation of the Riemann zeta function. And it is a product of five different functions, two to the power of s times pi to the power of s minus one, times psi of pi times s over two, times the gamma function of one minus s, which I'm gonna touch on a little bit in this video, and uh, um, times zeta of one minus s. And this relationship between s and one minus s is gonna be very important as you see. So what is the Riemann hypothesis? If you go to any other video or pretty much any paper, Wikipedia, you're going to see the statement, all the, non the Riemann hypothesis is that all the non-trivial zeros of the Riemann zeta function have a real part one half. I might call that into question a little bit and say that this statement is an equivalent consequence to the Riemann hypothesis, and you will see why. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, analytic continuation. Now, there were, I had this belief that given enough time and the proper resources, any problem can be solved. So how much time, how much time did it take uh, for me to make this discovery and then to, to be able to etch out a proof with uh, these other, my co-authors? Uh, 17 years for me, 17 years. And many of those were um, uh, 24-7, 365, okay, waking up at 4 in the morning, going to bed at uh, 3, you know, just getting a few hours. Um, a little bit obsessive for many of the years. And then sometimes 10 months off. Um, but I did look at it for about that long. And um, what I found fairly recently, like I said, about two years ago, a year and a half to two years ago, it started becoming clear um, of what I needed. I needed a, a new resource, not a new not some new mathematics, but um, something that you will see as we go. Now let's talk a little bit about the, the resources that Riemann had. He did have the Abel-Plana formula, where you can take um, certain functions, um, with f of n, and, you, and when you need to know the sum of them from n equals zero to infinity, uh, many times, many functions will work where you can apply them to this uh, formula, which I'm going to show you here. And at the top up here is the Abel Plana continuation of the Riemann zeta function. So any argument we want to apply to S, put S here, S here, it's going to give us some output, right? So how, do, how does this formula work? It's, it's very big. It produces very large, I mean, it's, I mean, look, it's, that's pretty clunky, you know, equation, but, um, it's uh, also very manageable, and the fact that it gives any output um, for any input is, is very nice. Good? All right. In other words, it converges for all s. It's an entire function, uh, except s equals 1. So how does it work? All right. So f of n would be, in this case, n to the power of minus s. And they're asking us to put uh, um, n equals 0 there. Well, we could turn this n equals 0 and change this to n plus 1. Uh, and um, this was discovered, I think, by Plana, 1826, and about 10, 15 years later by Abel, and Riemann wrote his paper um, on, given, on the number of primes up to given magnitude, uh, 1859. So you see he did have this at, at his uh, uh, disposal, but this is how it works. We're going to use this, and we're going to compare it with um, uh, Riemann's um, analytic continuation. All right. So. I'm not going to use n to the power of minus s, okay? I'm not going to. I'm going to use a different f of n so we can see that it works for just about any. All right, and this is a, um, uh, an, this is an alternate form of the generalization of the harmonic series, okay? Now, my f of n that I came up with, you know, and I didn't prove it or it's not in the paper, but uh, um, I'm going to use it here just to show how this works. All right, so my f of n is not equal to n minus, to the power of minus s, but as we sum it to infinity, uh, it does result in the same sum. 
All right, so we're going to take this and we're going to replace n with x and we're going to integrate it, all right? And we're going to end up with 1 over s minus 1. Okay, see how that works? Now we go to the second term and we're going to take that. We're going to swap out n for 0 and we're just going to just consider this to the right in the red and uh, everything reduces to 1 at uh, f of 0 and so we just end up with the 1 half in the second term. And now we're going to do the last one. It's a little trickier, but nothing you can't handle. We're just going to replace n with uh, it and minus it. Take the difference of those two functions, integrate it, and we get the final result above. Okay? So that's how that works. Neat? Now, in doing this, I'm particularly interested in this first term. Now, if you have ever taken a college course, first year college course on analytic continuation, and um, you probably have seen this and you probably use this, or 1 over 1 minus s. Um, and and it's it's pretty easy function to, to uh, work out with students. All right, it is the analytic continuation of the geometric series minus s to the power of n. The geometric series converge for the absolute value of s less than 1, as does this one. Um, and basically, anything geometric series is anything times s to the power of n. So here we have minus 1 times s to the power of n. We could do 58 times s to the power of n, whatever it is. And that's going to come out. That's going to be a geometric series. All right. Well, why is that interesting? Well, well, note here also we can get this really quick by, before I go why it's interesting. It also you can get this uh, um, by integrating f, uh, f of n in the traditional sense of n to the power of minus s. It will end up the same. But why is this interesting to me? All right. So if if Euler was pro like kind of like you saw last video, and if not, you go listen to it for this analogy, because I'm going to carry it through a little bit. So if Euler is a um, kind of, how would you say, pros like kind of approaches mathematics like a, a gold prospector would, and other math the mathematicians have as well. Um, Riemann, he, he, he does things a little differently. Uh, he's going for a different result. And right now, we have a very different problem. All right, so the Riemann hypothesis is a very different problem, and we're going to show it. But so I'm going to give an introduction before I show how this is done. I'm going to give you the insight that I had into this. If this is a big chunky rock and it has gold in it, I don't see any primes, right? So if it has gold in it, um, then I, I want to break this apart a little bit. I want to chip away at this to reveal the gold beneath. All right, now the zeros of the zeta function, as you're going to learn relate to the prime numbers okay and so i think you could consider both of them as, as significant and valuable something we're looking for all right so we're going to chip away out of here break off a piece and this is showing what's underneath we leave we see that that geometric series now this is the way i see it all right so i'm flipping back between these two and i see this as chipping away the irrational functions and irrational properties of this functional equation and what I want to do is chip it away to leave just the skeleton of this function underneath. And when I look at the abel plana formula uh, in comparison, I see geometric series underneath. I know, I understand there, there are rational functions. 1 over s minus 1 is analytic continuation of the geometric series. But I see that in there. And yes, of course, 2 is not a function. But maybe there's something else that cancels out that leaves 2 here. And what my thought is was after going down every other road, is what if we just keep chipping this away and take all of these rational functions and, and put them into one function and leave that function uh, multiple, uh, an algebraic factor of the zeta function. And maybe if we can do that, we, it can tell us something about the zeros. Maybe we will see the gold underneath. And indeed, that is what we get. All right? So, but returning to... Um, Riemann's functional equation, we have to understand what we're, what we're dealing with here. All right, so when he gets his functional equation, what do you think the first number he'd apply to uh, S would be? Okay, so it would probably be the first number ever applied to uh, the generalization of the harmonic series, which is 2. All right, so we know that uh, zeta of 2 equals pi squared over 6, but applying that to the functional equation, we end up with minus infinity. It's a little bit of a problem. Uh, since how do we say that pi squared over 6 is equal to minus infinity? 
Okay, so this is a problem. We know how it's a problem the way uh, Riemann wrote about it. He didn't just gloss over it and say, well, it's, you know, it's, we have all of these simple poles and all of the, the positive arguments. No, he, he wanted to eliminate it. And so, and, and I'll show you why I think that's neat and important uh, because behind, by doing so, he was led to the Riemann hypothesis and his final result. So let's see what he did. All right, so in order, to uh, uh, do this, he had to not eliminate the gamma function, but do something which you might think is more ingenious, but I'm going to say, not really. Anyone could do it, and you're going to do it right about now. All right, so take a look. We're finding where the problem is. The problem is the gamma function of 1 minus s, which happens to equal the factorial of minus s, which uh, you know ends up being minus infinity for all natural numbers greater than 0. All right, so what does he do? Well, everything you're going to do right now is pick a number between 0 and 1. The number that comes to your mind is 1 half, doesn't it? Um, I think so. Maybe you're thinking of maybe some other number between 0 and 1, like the euler mascheroni constant. I don't know. Probably not. Probably you're going to say, well, 1 and 2 and 3 and all of these don't work, but maybe right down the middle, let's go try those. Of course, we know that gamma function converges for these. And uh, so what is the gamma function of 1 minus 1 half? It is the square root of pi. Now, I have a hunch that he was going to try to uh, reapply this uh, square root of pi in there to cancel out the pi's, get them out of the way. Also, maybe uh, reduce this uh, so purely rational functions. Um, but it's not that easy. And what he got stuck at is something far more important and far more beautiful, and that is this. All right. The, so he took the s, he divided it by two for all. I mean, he's just redefining the function here by dividing s's by two in this way. And what he found is that this function cannot see the difference between s and one minus s. They end up being the same. So this function doesn't care. You could plug in s or one minus s, and it's going to give you the same result. And, and why is that so extremely important? Because it says that the zeros of the zeta functions are reflections of each other through the real point one half right here. So if this is over here, rho uh, h is a hypothetical non-trivial zero, we draw a line between it and this other hypothetical non-trivial zero, one minus rho h, we're gonna go right through the point one half. See that? And of course, if with any complex number, you have its complex conjugate, and it's going to go to his little partner over here, right through the real point one half. Now, let's give a little background on complex arithmetic really quick for anyone who's coming here and going, I have no idea what I'm looking at here. All right. You know all of the numbers, right? Or the real numbers. One, zero, one, two, three, minus one, um, one half. Pi is a real number. So pi would be somewhere here just on the real line, just past three somewhere. Okay? So those are all real numbers, and you've seen these number lines. All right. So a complex number has two parts. Think of it as a combo. All right. It's a combination. Two parts. A real part and an imaginary part. And this imaginary, calling it imaginary part is a very bad term, but you will get used to it. So a complex number has a real part plus an imaginary part. And what makes it imaginary? It's multiplied by the letter i. And the letter i is um, equal to the square root of minus 1. Does it have a value? No, there's no value for the square root of minus 1. We just call it i. So anything, any real number plus an imaginary num number is a complex number. And with those complex numbers, we can do anything that we could do with real numbers, add, subtract, raise the powers, all of that. But we can do so much more. So instead of plotting on a real line a complex number, we count over its real part and then up or down its imaginary part. So let's suppose we have uh, a number, a complex number, 1 plus i1, or 1 plus i. Okay, so we would just simply count over 1 and up 1. And we put a little point there and say that number is plotted on the complex plane. So the real one is also on the, on the complex plane right here. And then the real point one half, real number one half is right here, and zeros here, and so on and so forth. So this area between zero and one, 
is a very important area in terms of the Riemann hypothesis. It's called the critical strip. And uh, so you imagine um, this area going all the way up to positive imaginary infinity and all the way down to negative imaginary infinity. And it's all within that, that area of uh, between zero and one. Now, the dead center of that critical strip is called the critical line, obviously, because it's kind of center. And it's uh, all of these would have a real part one half. Okay, so they have a real part one half. So let's say we go over real part one half plus um, I, then we count up one. So we plot it right around here somewhere. Okay, so every complex number has what's called the complex conjugate. So if this is one third plus one fifth, well then one third minus uh, I, or one third plus I, one fifth, and one third minus I fifth fifth with these complex conjugate. Now I'm just kind of guessing based on where we're looking at here. And uh, um, and we denote its complex conjugate by putting this little line over the top of it, right? So we see the importance of that function right here is equality because we can actually, and we're going to show how, see the, uh, um, the relationship between the zeros of the zeta function. Now, they're not just the zeros, all right? So there's apparently in, in, in mathematics, there's many types of zeros. <laughs> They're not just zero, all right? So um, there are certain types of zeros that are referred to as roots, and these tell a lot about the function itself. And in the case of the zeta function, the roots tell us a lot about the prime numbers, all right? Now there are other zeros, they look like zeros, but they're not non-trivial zeros, all right? So they look just like a zero. They arrive at the negative even integers, minus two, minus four, minus six, all the way out there. Those also send the zeta function to zero, but they tell us nothing about the prime numbers, okay? So you see the little difference. Those are called the trivial zeros. The non-trivial zeros are, are all in the critical strip. Okay, and so far today, all of them uh, are known to have a real part one half. So that's where people get the uh, um, the equivalent consequence of that statement of the Riemann hypothesis as the real parts all have one half. We're going to show you what the Riemann hypothesis actually states, which is again is interesting if you want to take the the search, the prospecting in a different area. All right. The Riemann hypothesis is that t is real whenever xi of t equals zero. Well, there's no t in there, so what am I talking about? Well, so he liked this function so much, he, you know, he kind of, so a couple, one little modification, multiplied by one, s minus one. But he defined this as psi function. He demanded and mandated that all of the real parts of s equal one half, and then he defined psi over a, a function of t. So t is the input, and t could be real, t could be a complex number. It could be, I don't know, quaternion. It could be any number, all right? But it's that number that is multiplied by i in this, in this thing. Now, why is this a very important equation? All right, um, it, particularly to Riemann, and uh, it should be to you as well. Solve for the imaginary part of t, and come back at about, uh, you can pause this video, and come back at about a thousand years when you realize that there are no solutions. Actually, it didn't take a thousand years. By the rules of complex arithmetic, you can determine, we'll have to call, <coughs> excuse me, you can determine that there is no solutions exist. Um, and so I'm not going to go ahead and rearrange to show you because I'm going to do it in a different way with something new in the next video. Okay, so we're going to remember this equation, how very important it is, and we're going to do something similar, uh, which will lead to the proof. All right, so the hypothesis then is that, you know, you know, he demanded that the real part equals one half. All right, he defined, and his final result will end up being, having the real part in there. But um, the hypothesis is that, <clears throat> I'm being distracted by coffee again, I'm sorry. The hypothesis is that T is real for all of the zeros of psi. Okay, so there's zeros of the zeta function, and there's zeros of the um, 
xi function. And there's also trivial and non-trivial. In fact, xi of t shares all of the trivial and non-trivial zeros. It is just the multiplicative factor of the zeta function. But this is the function that is of most interest to Riemann. And it is because of this property, how the imaginary part ends up being equal to zero when the real part of s equals one half. All right. Now, <coughs> I should have water. Okay. So, makes sense? Are you lost? Well, just remember that you can't be found until you're first lost. So, you will be found. Don't worry. Let's first ask the question why might t be real when xi of t equals zero? Why, why does he suspect it? Uh, at this point in the paper, he didn't have his final result. He just he went on to explain. You can't have a hypothesis uh, without a reasoning. So you can't just say, I believe that, you know, big Newtons will grow wings and, and, and fly to the moon. Okay, why? Well, you have to have a reason why. So his reason why was this. All right, a value of S whose real part is greater than 1 and log of zeta function of S equals minus sum of log times 1 minus pi to the power of minus S. P, P to the power of minus, sorry, not pi, remains finite. And since the same holds for the logarithms of the other factors of psi of t, psi of t only vanishes for with this region minus uh, i over 2 and i over 2. Now, if you weren't lost before, come on in. Admit it. All right, I'm going to just kind of summarize a little bit of this. All right, so the Riemann hypothesis is uh, a hypothesis on absolutes. Okay, what is the dead center region between here? All right, forget, forget all this. I didn't mean to do all this. What is the dead center region? All right, it is zero. All right, so if the imaginary part goes to zero, that complex number becomes real. All right, so we can plot real numbers on the complex plane, but the dead center is is uh, um is uh is zero. Now there's some. So he's saying that the building blocks of everything that is going to lead to all of connect the zeros the primes all of that is going to be an absolute it's not going to balance it's 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 symmetric but it's only going to be symmetric on on the dead center of zero all right yes it's in this region you know you can prove that it's within this region and that region connects to the critical strip uh, uh, of the zeta function but how do you prove it that's his question he worked on a little bit and uh, and like I said before, um, I do believe he had all of the resources at hand to prove the Riemann hypothesis, um, but uh, I don't believe he applied enough time to it. So remember, I said I believe that any, having enough resources and enough time, you can solve any problem. And uh, like Euler, uh, it's just a matter of kind of sometimes getting lucky or having the right resources. I think it has to do with having the right resources. So this is Riemann's final result. Pretty big equation, very important. All right, this is his, I guess you could say, equivalent to prime counting function. We can give x any value, and it's going to output the number of primes up to that value. Isn't that amazing? I think it is. And uh, let's kind of break it down one by one term by, by term. Okay, so the first term here is the logarithmic integral. And uh, you see, it's, it's nothing you can't handle. It's just, you know, integral. You can plug this into any online calculator and it's going to give you a value if you um, apply uh, x to here. So you integrate up to x and it's going to give you some value. All right. We also have the logarithmic integral in the second term. And this is this is the one to look at. All right. So these halves, you saw them in the other, um, in the other, they're cemented in. You can't change them. All right. They're locked in. All right. We can't, we can't uh, manipulate them call them give them another real part nothing all right so what are what is alpha here those are the roots of the xi function all right and he says that he thinks they're all real that's the Riemann hypothesis all right he believes alpha is always real got it so when xi uh, but here he's not saying that he's just saying i just know that this works so he's going to start applying and he knows because he found first few of them uh so he was able to uh, um to see that his function worked. Uh, also, because this first term is so very close already to the um, prime counting function. And you immediately add this other sum, and you're going to, um, this the second term, and uh, um, 
you're going to get even closer and, and continue on for it. But before I get to these, second, uh, these next two terms, let's talk a little bit more about this. All right, so you take all of the zeros and you add the, the, the law, the sum of these two logarithmic integrals. So you got the complex number and you got the complex conjugate. See, one half plus I alpha and then if and one minus S, you know, is equivalent in this sense. So we have to do the complex conjugate one over um, two, one half minus I alpha. And we're gonna add those together. And for every alpha, we're going to sum that to infinity, or at least he doesn't know if it if there's an infinite number of non-trivial zeros. But for all the zeros that they are, are going to add up and give them some value, and we're going to add this to that. Now, um, let's continue. The next next term, um, I'm not going to get into it. There's uh, um, some elements of trigonometry in this, actually. I'm not going to get into it here, but I may do another video on it. Um, and this is, is very close, uh, close related to the logarithmic integral as well. Um, but uh, we're not going to get into it too much, uh, just because I don't have too much time. Uh, but the value that is output from here is very small, and it converges very rapidly. This term I do want to talk a little bit. Now, you remember when we did the Abel Plana uh, continuation and asked for, we let go of n, and we made it equal zero. Uh, a lot the similar way is resulting here in his analytic continuation, where he has xi of zero. So we drop out uh, its argument, or its value of t, which you remember, and uh, uh, we're going to just replace t with zero, and its value is uh, one half. Okay, so the log of one half also is equal to uh, minus log of two, which um, isn't terribly interesting, except that that is how um, mathematicians today have replaced the xi function, sent it off stage left, um, and to replace it with the zeta function. And uh, this is the result of doing that. Pretty neat. Um, we can, uh, instead of taking the zeros of the xi function, uh, we now can take the zeros of the zeta function, which we're going we're gonna to give a name, call them rho. All right, so now we're not making the assumption, the real part is, in there is one half, because we don't know for sure at this point, right? So we're just calling them, them rho. We do know that all of the, the roots, um, do have real part one half up until the trillions. I think they're 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 now coming up with so many of them. Uh, um, so we do know a lot of them. All right, uh, have real part one half far enough into uh, towards infinity that we can at least calculate our number of primes uh, less than a given magnitude. Okay, so does that make sense? Got it. All right, so again, it's kind of like the analytic continuation, the Abel Plana continuation, where we're stuck with all of these terms that give a result for any argument x. But um, what he has done here, this is the big thing the gold is in here, the prime numbers. Now he knows the number of primes up to a given magnitude. Very important. And what did he connect it to? The zeros of the zeta function, right? The zeros of the zeta function relate to the prime numbers namely the number of primes. But if you know the number of primes, you can actually manipulate to find if a number is prime or not. So it's just a matter of basic arithmetic at that point. But knowing them up to a very large number is complicated, solved with this wonderful equation. All right, make sense? All right, how do you prove it? How do you prove the Raman hypothesis? That'll have to show in a different video. Thank you so much. Um, please check the next video. That is where it's going to have all of the information uh, that is new. This right here is his review of the hypothesis and the history of the zeta function. The next video, we're going to get into the result that leads to the proof. And I thank you so much for watching.